Hi, this is Cynthia McKinney, and I'm sitting in again for Cindy Sheehan on Cindy Sheehan Soapbox. Today, our guest is Gilad Atman. It's wonderful to talk to you again. Um, just for the purposes of the audience, you were recently in Atlanta, Georgia, and I had the opportunity to see you, to touch you, to feel you. I held your hand, and guess what I discovered? I discovered that you are human. You're just like me. You're just like the rest of us. Yeah, it, it, it took me some time to become an ordinary human because, you know, you know, I was born and chosen, and it took me so many years to understand that, you know, I can degrade myself and, and then be like any everyone else. It's so much fun. But now here's the thing. It seems that from everything that we've that we're reading now about you, that some maybe some people have lost sight. Of the fact that at the end of the day, people who are characterized as controversial people, they're just regular, average, ordinary folks, but they have their own dreams, they have values, they have ideals, just like everybody else. So my first question, given that you are so controversial, Yes. Is, could you tell us who you are, Gilad Atzman? Yeah, it's pretty, pretty. Uh, <laughs> it's almost boring, but I'm, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a, basically a jazz musician. I play jazz for a living, which is an unusual uh, uh, endeavor uh, because usually um, jazz musicians don't make a living. Um, and, and I'm also a writer, and I write a lot about Palestine. I write a lot about Jewish identity, Jewish identity politics, and uh, I get uh, into a lot of trouble because of my writing, because I'm writing about subjects that basically we are not allowed to talk about. But it is very, very important for me for, to talk about. Initially, because I was confronted, at the front, uh, I was uh, awakened to the crime that is committed uh, in Palestine on my behalf. I was uh, an Israeli at the time. Um, and later, and especially now, this week, um, I became um, aware of the extensive power of the Jewish lobby, and I really try to understand what is going on now. For asking those questions regarding Jewish identity, Jewish politics, I have been called a racist, uh, an anti-Semite, a Holocaust denier, every possible slur in the uh, English uh, lexicon. Um, and I somehow survived it all. And the reason I think is simple because I'm actually really, really careful. I, I regard myself as an anti-racist um, thinker. Um, uh, and it is actually um, the racism that is embedded in Jewish culture, which I try to fight. And I have never uh, referred to Jews as people or as a race or as ethnicity. I mean, criticize Jews as people or, or ethnicity or race. I also never really uh, criticize Judaism, but I'm very, very critical of the of the culture, of chosenness, of the the exceptionalism that is imbued in Jewish culture, in Jewish uh, politics, and so on. Well, so now you've mentioned your identity, yeah. that you're Israeli and that you're Jewish and that you'd like to think of yourself as an anti-racist thinker. By the way, I'm not, I'm, I don't regard myself as a Jew anymore, which is something that a lot of Jews uh, uh, see as a major offense. But um, I decided not to regard myself as a Jew not because I wanted to offend anyone, because I didn't want to be privileged in any discourse. 
you know that uh, every time I say something, people tell me, as a Jew, you can say X, Y, Z. And I don't want to say anything as as a Jew, because if I'm right, if I'm correct in saying something, I want you, Cynthia, to be able to say the same thing. I don't want to be privileged anymore. I don't want to be chosen. Okay. Yeah. Now, in Atlanta, in your talk with us, you mentioned that you were very tempted to get your Ph.D. in philosophy. Yeah. So I take it that as you are going through this internal dialogue with your many selves to sort of define who you are, that it's grounded in your academic training and in your uh, literary interests? Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I am a philosopher, and as a philosopher, I'm, a, 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 I, I'm almost the total opposite of the activist. The activist needs some pragmatic uh, ideas. He has to tell his friends, tomorrow we are going to pick at... Uh, here and the day after we will boycott... Uh, someone else and as a philosopher I'm actually interested mainly in defining and refining the questions yes. so for instance one of the things that I realized uh, that is the most crucial uh, issue to do with uh, Israel the Jewish state I, I realized that if Israel defines itself as a Jewish state and uh, its tanks are decorated with the Jewish symbols we must be able to ask ourselves, who are the Jews? What is Judaism? What is Jewishness? What is Zionism? What, what are the relationships between Zionism and the Jews, Zionism and Jewishness, Zionism and Judaism? These are the most crucial questions. When we see the, 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 uh, the uh, uh, Zionist uh, uh, plunderous tendency to rob Palestinian people, it, did they invent it, or is it something that they uh, 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 find, uh, find in their in their Jewish heritage? I mean, in the Bible. Um, um, and my findings are very, very interesting. I wrote a book about it, The Wandering Who. The book is a bestseller. It is it is praised by the most important uh, professors and uh, and uh, humanists um, around. And still, I hear some people who are suggesting to me that I shouldn't read it, shouldn't, shouldn't say, or shouldn't ask these questions. I find it really uh, impossible. Well, you say that <clears throat> you've been called racist, anti-Semite, Holocaust denier, yeah. but when we were in that room in a very intimate setting with what I would consider to be a very good um, turnout, given the time constraint. Yeah, it was. I was surprised as well. Yes. But there were Jews in the room, and yeah. I saw them, and they were shaking their heads in agreement with you. Yeah, this is, some, this is amazing, because, you know, uh, obviously a lot of Jews and quite a few Israelis every day I have uh, at least one or two Israelis uh, coming to see me uh, because they support the thing that is very important what I'm doing in some of the, 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 the venues in some of the talks I was actually sharing stage with uh, with uh, fellow Jews yesterday I was uh, uh, I had a wonderful evening with Rich Siegel um, whom I admire uh, in Auckland, uh, we were three Jews on stage. I was with my friend uh, uh, Daniel Rayner, uh, who played piano uh, in the night, and uh, Dennis Bernstein, who was incredibly enlightening. Uh, so, yes, it is very clear that a lot of Jews uh, support what I'm doing. Also, it we must mention that there was not a single... Uh, event where anyone was offended by something that I said or, or, or complained uh, 
about any racial content, and then I come to the room in the night and I see uh, groups of uh, uh, 80 Jews who insist that I should be silenced. Yesterday I saw a group of uh, some actually interesting Palestinian uh, intellectuals who actually took more or less the same, uh, the same uh, take on the subject. It is pretty, pretty sad, and it is sad because if we really want to envisage a resolution for the conflict, we want to see peace in Palestine, we must understand what this identity is all about. We have to ask ourselves, how do we make people who regard themselves as chosen accept the notion of reconciliation and brotherhood? Now, the history of the Jewish people is saturated with cases of, uh, of uh, total resentment uh, towards dissent. You know, Jesus ca came up with the same question, said, how do we learn to love our neighbor? He ended up nailed to the cross. Now, uh, um, you know, Spinoza was excommunicated. Um, Marx was uh, uh, criticized harshly by quite a few Jews. Um, Zionism, by the way, Zionism, early Zionism was again an attempt to civilize the Jews, the diaspora Jews, that's the way they saw, it, saw themselves, and they were also uh, criticized by quite a few Jews. So my case is not very, uh, not very uh, peculiar, not very unusual. However, the, the, the tragedy is that, uh, you know, I'm a musician, I never wanted to see myself in the center of such a storm. I don't know how I ended up there. But the good thing is that I really can handle my case. So when they call me names and attribute to me some horrid titles, I really, I can really handle it. And, and I, 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 will, I will fight back. And I already published a very strong a response to, to this uh, uh, astonishing slur by, by Ali Abunema yesterday and a few others. Well, I'll have to read that. I haven't... I yeah, have... the Washington Report just published it. Okay. Uh, yeah. You... Because what I realize now, uh, interestingly enough, is that uh, apparently, so it seems, none of those people who are signed on that letter yesterday read my book. Mm. I've never heard about such a lack of integrity. And there is another question that uh, concerns me a lot, and I wrote about it. Um, um, you know, the people who signed uh, Ali Abunima, for instance, I have a lot of respect to, uh, to Ali Abunima, and uh, I think that he's misguided here, but he certainly is one of the leading advocates of one democratic state, which I also support. Mm -hmm. And if we talk about one democratic state, how dare he and his few friends um, are so dismissal of my of my uh, of my uh, uh, my right to express myself? Is not the the, 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 democr the one democratic state uh, supposed to be a, a tolerant place where people can express different ideas, or, or, or it's going to be democratic and monolithic like the Jewish state? If this is the case, maybe we don't need such a kind of democratic state. When I envisage a democratic state, I want to see a pluralist state, a state where people can adopt different ideas and have different attitudes toward different things. I don't want a democratic state where everybody has to, 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 to think the same. And if you don't think the same, you are smeared and uh, abused and subject to defamation. No, this is, not my, this is not my dream. And I think that it will be very difficult for us to sell such a dream to the Israelis and to the Palestinians. 
So they have to really think twice before they 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 uh, they continue with this approach. We have a serious problem at the moment in the Palestinian solidarity movement in London, in Britain. We have Palestinian activists and Palestinians who are who are expelled from the PSC, from the Palestinian Solidarity Campaign, for holding some views that are not exactly, uh, uh, um, you know, that don't, do not fit into the, into the official agenda. This is Stalinism. This is, no, n- not the, the pluralist uh, uh, discourse we want to, well, to advance. Part of your discourse is that you ask yourself, what is Jewishness and what is Zionism? For sure. Now, I've got to, to make an admission to you, and that is that, in all honesty, I um, had the opportunity to invite Yuri Avnery to Capitol Hill, which I did, and had to do... Uh, wanted to do a press conference, which we had the entirety of the Junity Coalition coming together for peace. And this was Jewish Voices for Peace, Not in My Name, Women in Black. I mean, there were about seven or eight different organizations, Jewish organizations, that are active around the issue of peace. Mm -hmm. And I was accused by the Anti-Defamation League of associating with fringe Jewish elements on my local television <laughs> back in Atlanta. Yeah. So now, what's wrong with you exploring for yourself, but you're doing it in a public way? What is Jewishness and what is Zionism? Uh, uh, don't don't ask me because I obviously do it. I already make it. Uh, I already made it very clear today that even if the entire Jewish people uh, stand up against me and the entire Palestinian people join them, I don't have any plan to stop because I believe that this identity is not just dangerous for, for, for the Palestinians, it is dangerous to the, for the Israelis, for, for world uh, Jewry, for America, and for world peace. At the moment, at the moment, we we, we see we see um, um, uh, APAC uh, pushing for a, another world conflict war, another world war, a global conflict, and it is pretty astonishing to find out that uh, that uh, the Jewish community lacks the means to restrain this approach. So, uh, so this is crucial issue, and 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 uh, I regard as a humanist. I think that this is my duty. Well, Gilad, um, I have to be honest with you again. I never heard of an anti-Zionist Jew until a few years ago, when uh, someone described themselves himself to me as that, and I didn't know because the idea that has been put forward is that organizations that are loosely associated with the pro-Israel lobby are the voice and representative of Jewish people. So now what I guess I'm hearing from you is that there is a difference and you're questioning what is Zionism and what is Jewish and what is Jewish exceptionalism. Could you answer what um, the difference or the distinction is that we all need to know and make appropriately? I came um, to the conclusion that uh, we have a slight, a slight problem with any form of Jewish political gathering or activism. Um, as you probably realize, um, you would find it, you probably find it hard to settle in Israel because you are not racially qualified. Yes? What does that mean, Gilad? 
Um, it means I mean, very, it means very little to me, but it means a, a lot uh, to them. Because Israel defined itself as the Jewish state, so the people who can settle in Israel uh, must um, be um, racially qualified as Jews. Now, Jews are not a race. It is quite absurd. Yet, the, the yet Jewish politics, and in particular Israeli politics, uh, is racially oriented. So, you definitely uh, would find it very difficult um, to to settle there. But ma- what is more disturbing is that uh, a Palestinian who who uh, was expelled from. Uh, from Palestine, uh, 63 years ago, can also would face the same the same uh, the same problem. He is not qualified to live on his own land. If, if so, for and, example, we have Ethiopian Jews whose skin is dark like mine. Um, and as you know, as you know, the uh, Ethiopian Jews are extremely oppressed. Uh, in Israel, subject to some huge discrimination, uh, there are a lot of incidents that they cannot even donate blood, which is astonishing. They can't um, donate blood now. Yeah, I read there recently that there was another problem. Yeah, yeah, they cannot donate blood. Um, it's a scandal. Um, well, but, but 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 let's take it one step farther. I also have a slight problem with Jewish organizations uh, that are also racially oriented and yet claim to be anti-Zionist. So you mentioned quite a few organizations, and I don't know how rigid they are, but they also uh, they support the Palestinians and support Israel, uh, but they also operate as racially exclusive organizations. Now, the problem that we have with it is that at a certain stage, not necessarily, but practically, this is what happens in most of the time, they start to look into their Jewish interests. Now, my friend Naida Izat uh, from uh, Gaza, a great poet, said a few months ago, she said, we really want as many Jews as we can in this movement. It is the Jewish state. It's very important for us to have as many Jews as possible. But march with us. Don't steer us. March with us. Yes. But don't tell us what to do. It's, a, yes. it's, it's our cause. It's our plight. I mean, Palestinian plight. Um, and I, uh, I understand it, and I, uh, I, I accept it, and I think that... Uh, uh, she should uh, be uh, listened to, and when she says it, when she said it, and uh, when uh, you know, she never asked anyone to be uh, boycotted, be denounced, be disavowed, or anything. We just want to create a pluralist discourse that is dominated by ethical thinking. That this is. This is the whole issue, and it's pretty simple. So, I I don't know if I um, <laughs> I leave this interview with as many questions as I entered it with. This is um, this is what happened when you talk to a philosopher, a <laughs> That's you know, right. <laughs> you know, you know, we shouldn't be afraid of questions. It's much better than having as many questions as possible rather than being convinced that we have the right answer for every situation or, 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 or incident or whatever. We, questions are good. One of the most touching uh, statements that you made in your presentation was um, you mentioned growing up Israeli that the Palestinians were invisible in yeah. your growing up, and mm-hmm. you compared that to poverty, poor people mm-hmm. in the United States, as you've 
done this tour and you've been to several cities. Yeah. And I'm struck by that because last night I was doing a town hall meeting in Baltimore and there was an 18-year-old child yeah. who was homeless. And he saw the flyer on the post and decided to come to our meeting and talk about his plight. So could you explain that a little bit more? Yeah, it is, it is very simple. You know, when I was, when, when I was a kid in Israel, we, we really didn't see the Palestinians, and when we saw them, we really didn't care much about their plight. Uh, we didn't care where they came from. We didn't, uh, we didn't see their suffering. Um, they were there. They were serving us, and uh, in spite of the fact that I argue that Israel is not uh, a colonial uh, state, um, we had a lot of colonialist symptoms. Uh, and when I talk about it, it sounds pretty astonishing to people, even when I talk about it in America. But then I mentioned to American people that um, just before I. Uh, uh, flew over. I uh, I uh, I saw a panorama uh, film a documentary about poor America, and I learned about 50 million Americans in deep poverty. And I'm now three weeks in your country, and I must admit that I don't see them. And why I don't see them? Yes. Because this society is extremely segregated. It is as segregated as Israel. And what is the meaning of it being segregated? It means that we are protected. We don't see the poor. Our uh, empath empathic feeling, feelings are not challenged like the Israelis. They don't see the Palestinians. The Palestinians are behind the wall. They don't see the Palestinians in Gaza because they, they are not allowed in. They don't see their misery and this is how we develop an exceptionalist blindness, racially driven, and this is a disaster. Because next thing, we are complicit in a crime, in a total crime. And I tell a lot of, a lot of uh, Americans now, whether you like it or not, we are all Palestinians, your neighbor. Your neighbor who was expelled from your town center into an unknown destination, so you just have to make sure that you don't see him or her, is Palestinian. He is your brother. We have to engage in true thinking about brotherhood. And the only way to defeat the Zionification of our planet is to think in terms of brotherhood, to learn again to love each other. Now, there was a phase that we were very aware of it, maybe 2,000 years ago, when Christ was uh, walking within sandals, you know, in, in the in kind of in the in the soil on the soil of Gal the Galilee. Uh, uh, but we really need now to be reawakened to those issues. We have to learn to see the pain of the other, sometimes to close our eyes and to listen to the pain of the other. And this is our only chance to save ourselves of a pretty dreadful fate. Gilad, you have challenged us to listen to the pain of the other. And I have to say that I found your talk in Atlanta to be challenging, thought-provoking, and definitely touching. I'm so touched by the journey that you have put yourself on. I, I, need, I need this word, especially today, Cynthia. Thank you so much for, for saying it. You are very dear to me. Well, I, I think that feeling is mutual, and I just want to tell the audience that if they have the opportunity to, vi to visit with you, to see you, to touch you, to feel you, that they will see your ultimate humanity, 
they will see that you are alive and that you are thinking and you're challenging us to think and also to care as well. Is there any final message that you would like to leave with the listeners of Cindy Sheehan's Soapbox? Ah, it's it's. I always finding for me to come with 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 the final message. But the message that I try to to share with your listeners, with your with the audience, sorry, in in Atlanta and with your listeners now, is very simple. We are too obsessed with the eye, mm. and we are too deaf to the pain of the other. We have to learn to really to, to, to close our eyes. We have to learn to close our eyes, not to think about a car, iPad, iMac. We have to learn to think ethically. And we can only think ethically when our eyes are shut. When we close our eyes, any idea of attacking Iran and introducing pain to millions of people sounds so sick, so sick. And well, we have to thing... stop to the people who try to push us this in, into such a, 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 a conflict. One thing that doesn't sound sick is your mean saxophone. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> I want to thank you, Gilad for coming on Cindy Sheehan Soapbox and spending this half hour with us. Thank you so much. Well, I hope that you are about like me with as many questions as there are answers from Gilad Atzman. He is extremely thought-provoking and challenging, and he's also controversial. But I hope that what we've learned from this is that he's also very human, and he just wants us to care about those people who are not cared about in our society today. Join us next week on Cindy Sheehan Soapbox.